I never thought it was gonna come to this day, Vince and Wendy, where I had to address the dark side like I am right now. But it, today is the day, all right? And here's the problem that I have with Memphis. Okay, Memphis, it's okay to have swag. It's okay to have confidence. Yeah. But you actually have to accomplish something or did something. They have done nothing as a team. Absolutely nothing. Like, even if you look at the Boston Celtics, right? The Boston Celtics, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, multiple conference uh, finals, went to the NBA finals. You look at a team like, you know, uh, the Golden State Warriors, a dynasty, right? They could carry themselves with a certain type of swag and carry themselves throughout the season and then have that confidence. The Memphis Grizzlies haven't got there. Like, we love that they ruffle the feathers and they're running up the chimney, running to the mm -hmm. smoke, and they're not ducking no smoke. But, again, they mm -hmm. haven't accomplished a damn thing. And so now I'm looking at this team, and to me, it looked like a bunch of individuals playing basketball. You're looking at John Morant. He's going out there. He's doing his thing, putting up numbers. Desmond Baines, he's playing for a contract. Dylan Brooks, he's playing for a contract. Jaron Jackson Jr., he's playing to probably try to get in the all-star game. You got rookies that's coming in off the bench who's trying to make a name for themselves. So they have to find a balance, not only to be consistent, but to lose themselves into the team. Brian? Mm. Yeah, obviously the schedule's been a little bit harder recently, but the loss of Steven Adams. I mean, I know that they handled injuries to other key players earlier this year. Steven Adams has a lot of important stuff for them, particularly with um, rebounding. His offensive rebound is one of their great weapons. He's one of the best offensive rebounders in the NBA the last <coughs> decade. And their schedule doesn't get any easier. They play in Cleveland tonight. I looked it up. Their plane didn't even land in Cleveland until 3.15 in the morning. I'll bet Whoa. those guys didn't get to bed until after 4. So not getting any easier. Yeah, it's not getting any easier. I don't know. As someone who was sitting, I was sitting across from Jaw when he said that, I think there's kind of a fine line between needing to kind of psych yourself up in order to get to that level. You know, like you have to kind of chirp a little bit in order to psych yourself up. It didn't feel like he was puffing out his chest too much in that moment, but you're right. It's one of those things that could come back to bite you if your play doesn't end up backing it up. NBA Today will have you covered with a five-hour trade deadline special. That is next Thursday. Woo-wee! So, if we're talking the trade deadline, we do need to bring in someone who's actually, you know, made some trades. Our front office insider, Bobby Marks, joins us. Hello, Bobby. But, Brian, I do want to stick with you here. Last Friday, when we had you on, you said that all eyes right now, they are on the Raptors and their seven-game road trip. So they're two and three so far. What does that record tell the league on if they're going to be buyers or sellers here? Yeah, the Raptors aren't making the pivotal turnaround on this trip that they were hoping for. And uh, it, it does, looks like they're sort of going to be on the outside looking in. So they're still waiting. Will the Raptors sell? And they've told everybody to wait till the trip is over. The trip is not over until this weekend. But everyone is keeping an eye on OG Ananobi. If the Raptors are willing to put OG Ananobi on the trade block, I believe conservatively there could be six or seven different teams, a lot of them contenders for the title this year, who are willing to put in a significant offer for him. It would really depend then on whether the Raptors prioritized getting young players so that they would pivot sort of more quickly than a full rebuild around Scotty Barnes, or if they pivoted, or if they decided to focus on draft picks, because that would change the order of uh, teams that you'd like for OG. They're not there yet, but teams are lining up, ready to make the phone call when, they, when and if they get the nod. Six or seven contenders, that's staggering because it does feel like we keep hearing OG Ananobi as a player that could potentially be out there. So if he is, Bobby, who are a couple of contenders that might be interested in him? Well, I think we can certainly cir circle Memphis as one of those teams, um, certainly sitting in the top, in the number two spot, right? And the other team is, is New Orleans, not in the top four, competing just to get into playoffs right now. But I think when you look at it from the Grizzlies' perspective, they've got the expiring contract of Danny Green. They have a nice young player in Zaire Williams. They've got all their draft picks. So if you're looking at a 2023, a 25, a 27 uh, pick to put in that deal, I think from New Orleans, I think the big question for me with New Orleans is, is Zion Williamson is healthy? Is this Pelicans team in the top four here? And they were before his injury, but you look at from the Pelicans, they've got Dyson Daniels, a nice young player, Jackson Hayes, Devontae Graham. 
They've got a ton of draft assets, a 2025, a 27, a 29. I mean, they've got a, a litany. We're not even including the Lakers, you know, swap and a, and a future first year. And the big question for me, Malik, and I've canvassed the league today, is that there's a lot of teams going into this, into this trade deadline with blinders on because of the unknown with this next CBA. Hmm. And that comes with OJ Ananobi, who is extension eligible this offseason, but he is limited to a 20% increase. However, if the extension rules are changed and teams know they can sign him long-term this summer, I think you're going to see more teams aggressive within the, within the next week. But that's the big if. Mm. Will there be some tweaks to the CBA? And will teams know by next Thursday? Yeah, that's a really interesting and important note. You mentioned that you're canvassing the league right now, just ears to the ground on what's going on. And you have an article up on ESPN.com, a column that highlights the six big trades that we want to see at the NBA trade deadline. And in it, you propose a little deal between the Bulls and the Lakers. Can you give us those details? Yeah, go big or go home, right? I mean, we heard Rob Palinka say, you know, that the two first-round picks in 2027 and 29 won't be moved unless it gets them closer to a championship. I don't know if there's that right player out there, but I've circled Zach Levine of the Bulls as that player there. However, there's a however to this. For the, Lake, for the Bulls to do a deal like that, because the Lakers are limited with those two firsts, they've got to take on the contract of Lonzo Ball. We haven't seen Ball all year. The likelihood is that he's going to be out for this season. He's owed $42 million over the next two years. That means the Lakers are taking it back, back to $220 million in salary. That is a tremendous risk for two players that, let's face it, have been you know seen more time on the injury list than on, on the court here. Hmm. All right, Brian. So can you channel your inner GM here? So, I mean, like who says no? Rob Palinka or Arturis Karnasovas of the Bulls? Maybe Jeannie Buss, the owner of the Lakers, who's looking at a crazy luxury tax bill. You know, the thing about it is, I know that Zach Levine has been a little shaky coming off another knee surgery, but I got to point out, the Bulls had never even signed a player in their history for more than $100 million. There is a number of teams out there that have three or $400 million players at one time. They had never done it ever in their history until they gave this $215 million deal to Zach Levine. And a deal with a team like the Lakers, it would represent a complete rebuild, the beginning of a rebuild. I think if you're going to trade him you have to look at probably trading DeMar DeRozan as well I don't think the Bulls are there yet I do think it's been a very disappointing season for yeah. them I do think that they were expecting more and that there's a lot of pressure from in, you know internally with ownership but I don't think they're ready to pull that ripcord but this is something we should definitely think about revisiting this summer what I, what I would like to examine here is whether or not the groundhog got it right we see your shadow here this is, um, a big one. This is how we're going to do it yeah. I want to look at some teams is, is spring going to shine on us or are they still in for winter? Are you ready? Yeah. So here's where we're going to start. The Pelicans, they've lost nine in a row. They're taking on Luka and the Magic tonight. What do you think? Is the sun going to shine or are we in for a long winter for the Pelicans? Well, first of all, let me say this. Last year I said that the Pelicans, you know, should, should consider, you know, selling their franchise. Well, I got jumped on by the entire Pelicans organization, you fan did. base, including my grandmother who was born and raised in Louisiana, who's Creole, and she said, Baby, you don't want those problems with those 80 old ladies who could possibly put voodoo on you. Well, Granny, I don't give a damn about voodoo, <laughs> and I don't give a damn about the 70 year old, 80 year old ladies, because I'm going to speak facts. And here's the facts there's no sun shining in New Orleans. This is going to be a long winter. And yes, they can say, oh, we're dealing with injuries. Zion's been hurt. But you know what? Zion is always hurt, so that is a problem. Beginning of the season, we had expectations for the Pelicans, possibly representing the Western Conference Finals in the finals. Hmm. But due to their lack of consistency and not living up to the hype, I don't see them getting past this. It's going to be a long winter for them. All right, a long winter for the Pelicans. What about this? Our Adrian Wojnarowski reported that Devin Booker could be back for the Phoenix Suns as soon as Tuesday. So <laughs> is the sun going to shine for the Suns? <laughs> The son's got more problems than parents with a middle child. And if you got a middle child, you understand what I'm saying. They have turned more. Did we see that smackdown that happened to them last night by the Atlanta Hawks? It's no chemistry whatsoever. DeAndre Ayton don't want to be there. It's no camaraderie. You see Chris Paul, he's sitting on the bench. He's not even engaging in timeouts. He's not even out there showing leadership at the moment. And if you think that Devin Booker is going to come back and solve the problems, you are wrong. They have to make a move. They have to make a big move. Otherwise, they're not going to get nothing accomplished. This team is built on championship 
or bust, it's going to be a long winter for you. All right, Punxsutawney Perk. Our friend Shanae Gumake would be disappointed if we didn't find some sunshine, some yeah. spring somewhere. So is there anywhere in the Western Conference playoff picture that you're looking like, hey, the sun may shine over here? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Right there in Golden State. It make, it's going to have shine. You know why? Because you still have Steph Curry, one of the greatest players to ever touch the basketball. You still have Klay Thompson, one of the greatest shooters to ever touch the basketball. You still have Draymond Green, one of the best defenders to ever play the game of basketball. And then you have Andrew Wiggins and Jordan Poole. I know they don't have the depth, and I'm not picking them to represent the West in the finals this year, but it's still something like there. You can't never count them out. So I will show some love to the Bay Area and the Golden State Warriors. Somewhere my dad, Mike Andrews, is very thankful that you picked this. Big Mike! The sun may still shine on the Golden State Warriors. Let's talk about the Lakers a little bit because they will continue their fight to get into the Western Conference playoff picture tonight as they face the Pacers. The Pacers, though, they're getting Tyrese Halliburton back in action. And remember, LeBron James just 89 points away from the all-time scoring record. He's averaged 27.3 points per game against Indiana. So according to Caesars Sportsbook, LeBron's point total prop is 29.5. So Vince Carter, how many points do you have him scoring tonight? LeBron James will finish this game with 32 points and a step closer to history. 32 points, Brian. <laughs> Well, his scoring average this year is 30.2. His scoring average last year was 30.3. I don't think he's going to be average, but even an average game from LeBron is over. I got to go over. All right, Perk. Mm. I'm going with the over, 35, peace wing dinner. And he's going to have a triple-double with it tonight. Oh. And they're going to get the win. Win, triple-double, oh, taking yeah. the over. You know what? You know what's crazy? Hey, and a wing v dinner. Uh, hey, and a wing dinner. VC, Couldn't forget that. VC. Why is What's Tyrese up? Halliburton coming back for this game? Shouldn't he want a warm-up game before he just <laughs> jump out there like that? Man? Tyrese Halliburton's not ducking anybody. It's not about ducking He's nobody. I'm just saying usually anybody. you want a tune-up game like the Pistons or something yeah, to that nature. And the Lakers are not a tune-up game. No, yeah. no, no. Lakers are not no. a tune-up game. Okay, I'm taking no. the over as well. Uh, Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.